Good morning. Welcome. How are you today? Good. Good to hear. Thank you for coming this morning uh, to the next event in the Agriculture Advantage series, uh, a week-long series of events uh, around agriculture and climate here at the Cup this year. Uh, this event is focused on the policy advantage. It's titled the Science Policy Interface for Climate Smart Agriculture in Action. What are the lessons learned? My name is Evan Gervetz. Uh, I'm from the International Center for Tropical Agriculture and CCAFs, uh, and I'm excited for this event today. Uh, I think looking back uh, at the Paris Agreement, uh, at the NDC process that's come out of that, uh, we see a, a real need uh, to bring uh, information, uh, evidence, science into the policymaking process to support uh, the development and implementation of policies and programs uh, to support the NDCs and other types of work uh, going on uh, around that. We know that many countries around the world have, a majority of them, uh, have agriculture in their NDCs, uh, both mitigation and adaptation. And so there's a real need and an opportunity uh, to bring together uh, the science and the information uh, to support the policy process in the public sector, not only though, also uh, with civil society and with the private sector uh, supporting their policies also. We know there's a lot going on out there uh, already. It, it's not like uh, this is new. Um, there, uh, us at SEAT, we've been doing some work uh, ourselves, the International Center for Tropical Agriculture, and developing uh, climate smart agriculture country profiles, working with various countries around the world, more than 30 countries uh, working in. Uh, in Asia, uh, our office there has developed uh, what's called a climate policy hub to bring science into the policy making realm and to support, support them in the implementation of their NDCs as well as the program development, uh, et, et cetera. Um, EFAT is engaging in many ways uh, in the science policy interface and, and, and many others. Uh, CTA, who's here today, uh, the FAO, uh, GIZ, the Global Alliance for Climate Smart Agriculture. There are many efforts going, around, around, uh, uh, going on around the world at the global level, uh, at the continental level, at the national level, and, and sub-nationally. And so really there's a lot uh, to learn uh, and to be shared uh, among us. And really that's the purpose of the event here today. Um, we we want to foster a dialogue. That's one of the, the goals of the event today uh, around the science policy interface for climate smart agriculture. Um, we want to increase our knowledge on uh, what are the roles of different actors in uh, the science policy interface. Um, what are the opportunities, what are the constraints for uh, bringing evidence, bringing science uh, into uh, the policy making realm for climate change and, and agriculture. And then finally, we want to uh, today move towards an action agenda for how can we improve the science policy interface, how can we foster it uh, in specific countries, in specific places to help support uh, the policy making, the program design, program policy implementation um, in these countries there. And so really that's what I hope uh, we can get out of this today and I think that, that we've got a great uh, set of panelists uh, who, who are here um, and we've set it up in, in a way such that um, the first part of the program is going to be really the, the view from the research community. And so we have two presenters, um, one giving more of a, of a framing on the issues, another one talking about some specific examples of, of working with policymakers at that science policy interface. And then second uh, part of the session today will bring up uh, the policymakers themselves um, from different countries, uh, the Philippines, uh, from Kenya, and, and looking at a network in Asia of countries um, that are working, uh, really the ones who are, who are doing the work themselves and have the demand, the need um, for, for, for bringing uh, the evidence and the science to support what they're doing. And then finally, we'll have the perspective from our development partners um, from various institutions that are supporting this work and really helping uh, to facilitate and, and, and catalyze um, better policy making and, 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 and catalyzing the, the fostering of the science policy interface for climate smart agriculture. Um, so that's an overview of our session. Um, it, it's quite packed and uh, so I'm asking speakers to, to stick to their time so we can get to um, some, good, some good dialogue throughout the program today after, after each of these sessions here. Um, a, a small bit of housekeeping, if you're on this side over here, uh, just be aware that uh, there's a, a live stream going on, there's a camera back there, and so if you do get up, try to duck around the camera so you don't uh, interrupt uh, too much. Um, so with that, I'd like to, to get into uh, some of the presentations and then uh, the discussion, question and answer um, with, our, with our panels today. Uh, first, I'm going to uh, invite Martin uh, Kowarsh, the head of Scientific Assessments, Ethics and Public Policy Working Group at the Mercator Research Institute on Global Commons and Climate Change, the MCC, 
in Berlin. Uh, Dr. Korwash studied philosophy and economics and is the as associate editor of the journal Palgrave Communications. He led the joint research initiative of MCC and UN Environment, UNEP, on the future of global environmental assessment making. Uh, jointly with other colleagues, he developed the pragmatic enlightened model for assessment making. And this model influenced uh, the assessment strategy of the IPCC Working Group 3 um, in the last assessment report. Uh, Dr. Kowash is also a member of the Network Development Group of the International Network of Government Science uh, Advice, INGSA. And with that, uh, Martin, please. So, thank you very much for the very kind introduction and for the invitation. Um, so actually, we can observe uh, an increasing interest in the reflection on the science policy society interface. There are various events, workshops, initiatives popping up, for example, the INGSA network, um, and a, a lot of publications out there. And actually, I think stepping back um, and reflecting on this interface is worthwhile because it can, in the end, improve uh, governance. Um, the criteria of uh, credibility, uh, legitimacy, and policy relevance or salience, they are uh, widely shared, but they alone can no longer guide uh, the science policy interface. So we need a more precise understanding, more specific understanding of what these criteria mean in practice. I'd like to present you a few insights from uh, the project that uh, um, uh, was just mentioned on um, by a joint initiative um, by UNEP, UN Environment, and the MCC to reflect on the science policy interface in the sustainability realm, um, more precisely about global environmental assessments. And actually, for this project, um, we asked um, several national, uh, or we analyzed um, what different national governments, international organizations, and other stakeholders um, thought about uh, the reform of the IPCC. And actually, this is the result. Um, they were mainly interested in focusing more on, on solutions. So what the demand um, is to, to have more assessment of solution options um, in the realm of climate change, um, mitigation, and adaptation. And this is particularly interesting in, in the new context of uh, the emerging landscape of international environmental governments, for example, the, the Paris Agreement and the adoption of the SDGs. And so there's a need for better understanding in the dependencies between um, policy fields, um, the, the interlinkages between um, um, policies, um, and so side effects, co-benefits, and all this stuff. And I think while there's a lot of expertise on, on climate smart agriculture and adaptation mitigation in, in agriculture, um, and there's still a lack of, of a higher level of, of integration across different policy fields. Uh, just an example, I mean, we still have two separate IPCC working groups on adaptation and impacts on the one hand and on mitigation on the other hand. So how, um, so the attempts to, to better integrate these and interlink these are uh, still limited. Um, and I think also on various governance levels, on national level, subnational level, regional level, um, a lot of um, open questions still remain. Let me explain what kind of knowledge is needed in principle more precisely. It's a complicated figure, but it's uh, important to understand that um, the point is we do not only need to better understand options to achieve like multiple targets such as the uh, SDG related targets. It's more or less um, more important maybe to understand the practical implications of these options and uh, Understanding these implications, for example, in terms, very obviously, in terms of productivity, economic implications, but also distributional effects, food security. You have the side effects of uh, GMO, fertilizers, pesticides. You have effects on freshwater resources. Uh, you have, of course, this climate change uh, effects, all these things. But also, maybe um, less discussed uh, effects in terms of cultural effects, um, procedural effects of different policy pathways and options. And analyzing and better understanding them will help us better integrate these policy fields. And in fact, um, in light of these consequences or practical implications, we might have to revise the initial set, uh, sets of means and policy goals. 
Related to that um, is another challenge, uh, a twofold challenge, and this has to do with big literature. Um, as we can observe, at least regarding um, climate change, we have an explosion of literature. Um, the next IPCC assessment will have to deal with roughly 300,000 publications in the realm of climate change. To be comprehensive, which is still the mandate of the IPCC and other assessment bodies, somehow bibliometric tools so have, have to be adopted. But there's also another challenge, and this has to do with the variety of variability of results uh, also regarding uh, agricultural policy. So there's um, sometimes a cacophony of, uh, of uh, results, for example, effects of GMO or fertilizers or pesticides, to, to take these examples, or the potential and limitations of uh, ecological agriculture. I mean, these are highly disputed things, but there's also highly disputed um, studies related to that, um, very different viewpoints, and to bring them together and make them comparable and at least understand why they differ, we need um, yeah, more systematic meta-reviews and meta-studies. So this is one, uh, um, another challenge related um, to the solution orientation that is demanded currently. A third uh, field of challenges is related to the legitimacy, obviously discussing solution options uh, uh, regarding the future of agriculture involves lot, lots of value-laden conflicts. Um, the IASTD, the Agricultural Assessment a few years ago, had huge problems with these value conflicts and actually um, had a hard time to deal with them and this should be a warning signal. So what do we do at the Science Policy Society interface with these um, diverging values and diverging um, yeah, few points in the end. Um, and often because it's so disputed, many decision makers and experts thinks, think that uh, experts should not touch upon these uh, value-laden things. And so we have two standard models um, still um, out there in, in practice. One is the technocratic model, the other the decisionist model. Technocratic model tries to avoid value-laden conflicts by identifying some value consensus or allegedly value-free uh, determination of both policy objectives and means, uh, while the decisionist model um, just takes um, political targets as a given and only identifies uh, the appropriate means for uh, achieving these targets. But in both cases you have the problem that, uh, yeah, what about unintended consequences? What about side effects, uh, co-benefits? Uh, who is responsible for them and who has to, to deal with them? And the, uh, more pr in, in principle, the problem is that, that facts and values are so interlinked, so entangled, that these models uh, in practice and in theory always fail. So what, uh, what can be done? There's one, um, one approach that the IPCC um, Working Group 3 tried to, um, to realize uh, last time for, for the AR5 uh, assessment report. Um, and this is the joint and integrated cartography of alternative policy pathways. The idea underlying this is that you cannot avoid addressing value-laden things in, at the Science Policy Society interface. So how do you do that? Um, there's no way to do this, like, to just determine what's the right or wrong uh, value belief or, or just to, to present facts without any value implications. But instead, what you have to do, um, just present alternative pathways, but not only that, really try to, to explore the implications, as I said before. And this may facilitate a learning process among all um, actors involved, actually including the scientists and the experts. It's not only a learning process among the policymakers, it's really about the learning process um, among everyone involved about the pros and cons of alternative policy pathways. It's an iterative process. It's, it's sometimes um, yeah, painful and, and a very long, long uh, time-consuming process, but, but it's very worthwhile. And actually that's uh, one of the results of our uh, studies with, with UNEP, that actually the impact of scientific policy advice rarely is about influencing any policy de decisions directly. It's more or less, it's more subtle. It's about facilitating these learning processes, um, facilitating a deliberation. It might turn out, um, that some overlap might be identified between very different and disputed value um, beliefs and in, um, overlap in terms of uh, policy options that, that might uh, serve various uh, value, uh, value beliefs and, and value sets. And at least it might help better understand what the conflicts are actually about because 
discussing and arguing about um, abstract values is rarely a fruitful exercise. So, uh, final slide. Um, Large-scale assessments uh, that bring together um, this, yeah, different viewpoints from the sciences um, and try to uh, assess them to synthesize this knowledge, meta-studies, meta-analysis, and, and, and in the end assessment, together with stakeholders, very different stakeholders uh, from business industry, NGOs, and of course uh, governments and different uh, decision makers. Um, these processes, um, there are more than 140 uh, global environmental assessments thus far. I think they are, despite being time consuming and, and often being painful, they might provide the opportunity um, to explore these pathways. Um, and there's also increasing attempt to do this on, on national levels. And of course, there are various challenges related to that in terms of capacity resources and also the incentives within sciences to at all provide solution-oriented knowledge. Um, but this is, um, this is roughly overview of, um, of um, this project. Um, thank you very much. Stop here. Hey, uh, thank you very much, Martin. Uh, that's that's fantastic. Uh, I, I liked uh, the point about uh, people don't want to hear more about the problems from the assessments. They want to know what the solutions are there and understanding what the effects of their decisions might be. Um, and that really uh, the science policy interface is not maybe something that you go force, but it's more of a subtle way that uh, that, that you work uh, in, in, in influencing the learning processes. Um, of, of the uh, of the policymakers, and uh, so I think that's that's very insightful there. Um, great. Next, I'm going to invite up uh, Dr. Godfroy Grosjean, uh, who's the the lead Asia Climate Policy Hub uh, at the International Center for Tropical Agriculture, SIAT. His research interests include climate smart, resilient agriculture, carbon markets, and incentive mechanisms for mitigation and adaptation, climate finance policy analysis, and evaluation of barriers to upscaling uh, the implementation of climate policy. Uh, before joining SIAT, Godfoy worked at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research PIC and the Mercator Research Institute of Global Commons and Climate Change, MCC. Uh, his other work experiences include GIZ, UNDP, uh, um, among others, uh, PricewaterhouseCooper. And uh, with that, I'll invite up uh, Dr. Godfoy Grosjean. Thank you very much, Evan. <coughs> um, so M Martin provided us with a very nice uh, overview and analysis uh, in, in the functioning of the science policy interface more at the global level. Uh, what I would like to do now is to share with you some experiences uh, we had working at the science policy interface but at the national level. Um, before uh, moving forward, let me just briefly introduce uh, you uh, who we are, SIAT. So SIAT is the International Center for Tropical Agriculture. It's, a, it's part of the consultative group on international agricultural research. In terms of research focus, we have three key um, areas. The first one is agrobiodiversity, then soils and landscape, and then decision and policy analysis, which focuses on climate change, uh, linking farmers to market, ecosystem services. Within the CGIR uh, family, um, SIAT is uh, leading um, globally the common program on climate change, uh, agriculture and food security, uh, CCAF, that some of you may know. Um, so that, that's enough about, about SIAT. Now, um, we, we talked a lot about, um, about climate smart agriculture, so I would like to start before moving forward to define a bit what, what we mean and what is the, 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 the approach behind climate smart ag agriculture and wh what is the, the, the sort of rationale to have developed uh, this approach. The, the agriculture sector, as many of you know, is quite unique in the way that it has to uh, simultaneously um, adapt to the impact of climate change because it's one of the sectors most affected by climate change. But at the same time, um, if we want to um, achieve the Paris Agreement, the sector will have to contribute significantly to emission reduction. Then on top of that, to make it even more complex, the, 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 the sector is facing emerging challenges like growing population, 
changing in diets. And also still a lot of the world poor depend on the agriculture sector. So the sort of solution um, to, to those challenges is, is quite complex. And this was the idea behind the uh, concept of climate smart agriculture that has been pushed forward by different organizations, including uh, FAO, SIAT. And the idea behind is really to try uh, to identify options and practices that maximize the synergies between um, adaptation on one hand, but also mitigation and reduction of emissions when po possible and increase in productivity. So to really focus on, the, on this um, um, at the center and, and, and of, uh, um, of adaptation, mitigation and productivity. Now, the, the challenge here is that this is quite complex because to achieve such a transformation with multiple objectives requires the, the um, first a, lo a lot of um, evidence-based support to understand what are the potential solutions and also the involvement of many actors uh, so that the transform transformation can take place on the ground. So as a response to that challenge, within SIAT Asia, we decided to rethink a bit the way we engage at the science policy interface by uh, creating a new initiative which, is called, which we call the uh, Asia Climate Policy Hub. The, the idea behind the, uh, the Climate Policy Hub is, uh, relies on three core objectives. The first one is um, to link. So we intend through that initiative to strengthen our role as interface between SEAT scientific output on climate change and decision-making processes in private and public sectors by developing new kind of partnerships, and I will come back to that in a second. Second, as we are a research organization, we uh, think, so we focus on economic and policy analysis, but with the objective to seek the integration of multi multidisciplinary methodologies to provide comprehensive analysis to complex problems. So bringing uh, economic and policy analysis together with the expertise we have on biophysical uh, work and, and, and so on and, and so forth. And finally, the third principle our approach is to sync, and by this we mean to synchronize our research output with the needs of the partners we work with. And I will come back to this in a second, but just to give you an example here, we develop a user uh, online user-friendly tool for cost-benefit analysis that is now being used by a variety of actors uh, in the Philippines, for example, and in, in other countries. Now, I emphasized before about our focus on partnerships because, thanks. As we've said before, this whole transformation requires many actors to work together. And we wanted to rethink a bit the way we develop our partnerships. And we do that through two channels. The first one is to seek to develop more long-term partnerships with key public and private sector, sector actors, and as well as, as academia. So just to give you an example, and the list is not complete, but with, uh, in the Philippines, we worked with the Department of Agriculture, helping them uh, design and implement a program that is aimed at uh, developing a long-term strategy for the upscaling of climate smart agriculture in the whole country. With the international organizations like the World Bank and FAO, we are developing common methodologies like the Climate Smart Agriculture Country Profile that I will uh, discuss in a second, and we work jointly on, on that in many countries uh, globally. We also work with the private sectors, for instance, with Mondelez in, in Indonesia, helping with um, the monitoring of uh, their own supply chain and its impact on uh, land use change. Another um, key approach for partnerships has been to work closely with uh, regional bodies like APEC. So for instance, we have been supporting APEC in developing a multi-year action plan on food security and climate change. And now we're part of a committee that pilots the implementation of this uh, action plan. So that's about those long-term, developing more long-term institutional partnerships. Now, on top of that, we have created a board of advisors, which we are now extended, extending, sorry. And the idea behind the board of advisors is to have senior people who are from different backgrounds 
private, public sectors, international organizations, and can help us understanding, anticipating better the needs in terms of research of our different partners, and, strateg and strategizing how we can package research output so that it's as useful as possible to the, fine, to the end users. Um, okay, so now um, that, that's about the concept. Now let me just give you some uh, specific examples on work we have been doing. One of our key um, uh, tools that we have been working on to, to promote uh, engagement um, on, on CSA is what we call the CSA country profile. The idea behind the CSA country profile is to assess the status of CSA in a country. It's a stock-taking exercise, um, which is organized around three key pillars. First, understanding the context of the agriculture sector and its exposure to climate change. Second, we look at potential promising and existing CSA technologies that could respond to the specific challenges the sector is facing in a country. And finally, we analyze the policy and institution landscape to try to understand to what extent it's an enabling environment to upscale CSA or not, and what are the key gaps. So the, that's the sort of um, uh, content of the CSA country profile, but the, the, what is quite interesting about it is not only the content, but the process to collect this content. So it's based on existing literature and database, but much more importantly, it's based on a lot of stakeholder workshop and stakeholder engagement, um, where uh, basically we try to um, collect existing knowledge in the country and try to create a momentum around CSA in that country. So it's much more of a starting point in itself to promote then further discussion on climate smart agriculture. And I'll come back to that in a second. So we have been doing, uh, also together with Evan, um, uh, CSA country profiles in, in many countries. In purple are the ones that are completed. In green, the, uh, uh, in orange, the ones that are currently in progress. And in green, the ones that are um, under consideration. But one of the key takeaway here is that throughout this process, we have been involving um, uh, more than 1,500 experts and institutions. So really creating a sort of uh, global, or supporting a global dialogue on CSA through the CSA country profile. Now, in addition to that, um, we have been working in, in Africa as well, and, and now in Asia, on um, subnational climate risk profiles, which are similar to the CSA country profile, but looking more at the regional level, involving also regional actors. And um, th one of the key differences is that it looks at the entire supply chain. So for all the key actors in the supply chains, what are the risks they face related to climate change and what are the potential solutions? And again, it's a similar process, which is very participatory and engaging uh, different actors at national and, and local level. Um, now, the um, CSA country profile, as I said, is one of the tools of the uh, Climate Policy Hub, but its aim is basically starting the discussion, being a stock-taking exercise. But eventually, what we intend is that, um, or what we uh, seek to do with the Climate Policy Hub is to create methodologies and tools that can support the decision make the different stages of decision making afterwards from stock taking to prioritizing interventions for instance we have developed um, the CBA tool that I mentioned supporting piloting so helping the the, um, the implementation of climate smart villages uh, Alice will discuss that in a second but also informing policy design and, and implementation. And uh, um, Martin mentioned the, the, the trade-offs across objectives, and now f um, this is really something we're trying to look at together with YASA and the World Bank in Bangladesh. We're trying to understand better what are the long-term implications of, um, of certain, a certain set of policies in terms of reducing emission, but also in terms of food security and uh, impact on poverty. Okay, so very quickly, my last slide. Um, so now I just want to tease out some of the lessons learned um, working at the science policy interface in, in, in the context of research for development. So it's not a comprehensive review like uh, Martin did, but some of my thoughts that can contribute then to the discussion later. So credibility of research is highly important, this is no question, but legitimacy and relevance is as important if we want to have an impact on decision-making processes, on policy-making. 
the process matters almost as much as the output. And from, for, to that purpose, it's important to build long-term relationships and trust among the different actors, the scientists, the decision makers, the policy makers. Timing is key. So if there is already a sort of momentum in a country, for instance, to talk about CSA, and then you provide scientific support to that, it's usually much more effective. But the problem is, this is something scientists can hardly influence, whether it's a good timing or not in, in the country. So we can try to bring the discussions to raise awareness, but there are many fac other factors that play a role um, in terms of being the right timing or not um, for a certain topic. When we interact with decision making, it's important to define from the beginning how and by whom the output in terms of research will be used and how it will be integrated in decision making processes and in policy making. And from that point of view, it's also key to think strategically how to maintain institutional memory because too often we see um, um, similar research sort of uh, work that is done independently without uh, coordination by different institutions or a bit later, a few years later, we will do the same that has been done before. And that the main issue is this lack of knowledge management and institution memory that is often occurring and, and forgotten when we design projects in terms of research for de development. So emphasizing on, on, on uh, developing knowledge management strategies from the beginning and with the key actors is highly important. And finally, we have to deal with the, the complex processes, often involving multiple actors, overlapping policies, competing objectives, and information overload. So the, 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 the policy process is messy, and that's just the, the reality. But um, Martin emphasized the importance on, of, of, of stock taking work like with the IPCC at the global level. But I think at the national level it's also very important to address those and to do to be able to synthesize existing information and provide a stock taking so that the, the, the decision makers have a starting point uh, to, to move forward because often one of the main challenges is that they are overwhelmed by the amount of information. So trying to synthesize information and, and, and stock take is, is key to have um, um, impact on decision making. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Godfoy. Uh, now I'll invite both of you up here um, to take some questions from the audience. We've got about uh, five minutes or so now uh, for some questions, and so I would open it up uh, to anybody who has one to ask and uh, have a question, make a comment, start a discussion. assessment since the 1970s and it's roughly 140 ones, including IPCC, UNEP's GU assessment, uh, IPBES, uh, Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, IASTD, to mention just a few. Um, yeah, like 140. But I was not, um, I mean you're right, I, I was talking mainly about the global level because our research was mainly about the global level, but as I mentioned at, at the end, um, most of the things, both in terms of challenges and opportunities and, and uh, options for the science policy interface are also relevant to the, uh, to the regional and national level and there are a few attempts also to do some like IPCC assessments on the national level, we had this in Austria, but also other attempts uh, with biodiversity or regional assessments, GEO is increasingly um, trying to, to have this regional assessment idea, so this is the link to the national level and the regional one. Uh, yes. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, it's quite nice the presentation you made about the, uh, how you showed how complex it is to, to make these decisions. But at the end, we all know today that we are not going to, to meet the, the targets of uh, two degrees, to, to remain be below two degrees plus two degrees. So how do you prioritize the extreme solutions to achieve that? Because, uh, I mean, 
you, you can, if you want to, to, to uh, satisfy too many objectives, you can be nice in the short term, that's very good. But in the long term, and in, in regard with the targets of, of, a, of a, a Paris Agreement, you will never achieve it. And so, to have a priority for what is very, very important, I mean, I just could give an example. You have presented uh, examples for Asia, why it's quite complex, because a certain number of things, uh, it's difficult to improve uh, certain things. But in Africa, it's quite simple to improve a certain number of things. For instance, the amount of fertilizer that you use is very low compared to the rest of the world. And even just by improving that, you could improve a lot and reduce greenhouse gas emission uh, by avoiding future deforestation in a continent where the population is going to double. So, uh, uh, I mean, it's very simple and very important. But if you don't start with that, we, you will never achieve that. What's your opinion? Um, well, first of all, regarding the two-degree target, um, uh, I'm not as clear as you are uh, well, on, on the question whether we will achieve it or not. It's still, I mean, it will be difficult, uh, so the, for sure, but uh, um, I think there is still a possibility to achieve it. But uh, that's not the, the, the main point on the question. But the, so. I think there are two things in the agriculture sector. The first one are the sort of win-win options, the no-brainer options that can still be implemented where basically you improve productivity, uh, you reduce emissions and, and, and make the agriculture sector more resilient. So there, there still exist um, some degree, there are still many of those options that can be implemented. Now the question is to what extent those options when you implement them bring us on a pathway that is, let's say, consistent with the uh, two-degree target or not? And how big is the gap? Because if there is still a big gap, then it means that much more radical um, options will have to be implemented where the trade-offs will be stronger. So you will have to sacrifice one thing for the other. Now, I think as scientists, uh, we're not there to, to, to tell, you know, what trade-offs or uh, should be emphasized on or what are the, pr the main objectives, what we can do is to make it clearer to decision makers what are those trade-offs, what they entail, and then map the different options. And then based on that, decision makers at the end have to make a political decision on what is their objectives. But I think that goes beyond then the, the, the work of, of scientists. Yes. Um, thank you for the presentation. It was both very interesting. And for the second speaker, I'm sorry I didn't catch your name. Um, but I'm wondering if you also, you mapped out a four-step process about stock taking and it kind of carries through. One of the things that I didn't notice, um, but it seems to be really relevant also for a science policy interface is um, how do you ensure that the policy is hitting the target that you wanted to achieve? Is there a role for um, making sure that certain um, intermediate uh, goals or targets are being achieved and then also that in, in the case of climate smart agriculture emission reductions and other uh, um, benefits are also being hit um, and how does that play in because it seems that there should be a feedback loop of decision yeah, back sure. to that. So uh, th that's a very good point and, and, and I didn't touch upon this but we're working a lot also on uh, monitoring and evaluation for, for instance, I uh, don't know if uh, Alice will, will bring that up. <laughs> uh, part of the SAMIA program that, that is uh, there to basically upscale in, in, the, in the Philippines uh, with the Department of Agriculture, which is there to upscale CSA in, in the country, there is a component uh, of research on m and &E and uh, what, try to define what kind of indicators you can have to, 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 to monitor progress and then based on progress uh, to the decision maker need of course to, to respond and, and so definitely this is this is a good point that I didn't touch upon but it's certainly uh, important to take into consideration. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Let's take uh, two more questions quickly if you guys can. Uh, so uh, first here, here, yeah. Then. Yeah, so I think I really like the multi-stakeholder approach that you presented and also the fact that we need to present the different options so that um, yeah, policymakers will think about which um, options are best for their particular setting. And definitely that also brings on the trade-off. But my question then is if you look at the different actors, definitely there is going to be some form of 
power structures, which would also influence the outcome of the different policy options that they will choose to implement. And how do you deal with this? Uh, yeah, that's, a, that's a tough one. Um, I, I think at the end of the day, uh, we're not there to, to lead the agenda. We're there as support in terms of helping understanding the question, the challenges, and the possible solutions. Now, when it comes to the sort of power structure and struggles you may have behind, uh, you know, decision-making processes, um, I, I think our role stops by just being uh, transparent or trying to improve transparency of what different policy options entail, and then at the end, how it plays behind, uh, you know, closed doors or how the sort of policy, the, the power structure is organized. It's something. It's hard for us to really influence, despite by bringing knowledge and information and making um, transparent the implicate or trying to make the transparent the implications of certain decisions. Okay, one last question for this, uh, this uh, part. Well, okay, mine is uh, about the involvement of private sector because we're talking about science policy interface, but the, the real implement it, and if we're looking on the sustainability, private sector has a bigger role to play. Of course, they're influenced by the policy and, uh, and also the science that is behind it, but how does, like in the case of these profiles, how does, do you think it influences uh, private sector to be more engaged in the policy making decision as well as scientific research which are being undertaken? So I think, the, the first of all, the, the private sector has a lot of knowledge. They are already, for instance, like large uh, multinational companies helping the, 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 the supply chain become more resilient because it's in their own interest. So involving them in the discussion uh, is valuable also in terms of bringing knowledge and, and information. Now, the key to involve or to make the private sector interested is to provide them incentives to change their behavior because the private sector will not just change for the sake of changing. There needs to be business models that makes you know, s implementing certain practices interesting for them. Or you need to provide other sort of policy incentives like carbon pricing or uh, carbon offsets or so to make the private sector move. So I think then it's really a discussion we need to have within the science policy interface how to make the private sector move and uh, change its behavior. But for this, this you need basically um, clear incentive structure for that. Okay, thank you guys thank uh, you. very much. And uh, as a a summary or a couple take-home messages for me. Uh, one is that even though we're hearing uh, from scientists up here, uh, the process of, of, of how science is engaging with policy is very important. It's not just necessarily about what you're doing, but how you're doing, how you're engaging with the policymakers, um, uh, about learning processes um, being relevant. Uh, the process is really more important in a lot of ways than the final product, but it's, it's how do you uh, influence that final product through those processes. Um, so with that, I'd like to transition to have uh, some of our policymaker colleagues come up uh, and, and join us and, and give us their perspective and a time for us to have some dialogue with them. Um, first, I would like to invite uh, Alicia uh, Ilaga up, who's uh, with the AMIA Platform of Partnership and Innovation. Uh, Alice has 22 years of experience in the formulation and oversight of agricultural policies. Um, she w was the former director uh, until October 2017 of the Philippines Department of Agriculture Systems-Wide Climate Change Office, which oversees the department's adaptation and mitigation initiative in agriculture. Uh, and that's the AMIA. Um, she also is one of the negotiators for the Philippine delegation here uh, for the UNFCCC uh, COP and officially represents the Philippines in the ASEAN and EPIC food security meetings. And with that, I'd like to invite her up here uh, to speak. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Mabuhay from the Philippines. It's saying mabuhay. <laughs> mabuhay means to be alive, to celebrate life. <laughs> so this morning, I'm going to present some practical applications of the science, how we have used science to imp influence the climate policy in the Philippines, and how science is used 
to advise ground action and how ground action is advising policies also. I'm here presenting the best practices uh, as I have experienced it when we were implementing EMEA. Uh, right now, I have a new shop, but it's leveling up, giving more financing, credit, and guarantee to the different climate uh, adaptation practices in the country. So my, uh, my topic is about delivering EMEA villages across the country. So what everybody needs to know. Okay, so let me introduce Amiya. Amiya is climate risk while pursuing sustainable livelihood. And the basic approach is climate resilient agriculture. Good for us talking about climate smart agriculture. But we in the Philippines have expanded the idea to highlight that it is not only technology which is necessary to build resiliency. It is also introducing institutional and social innovations and accessing climate-relevant support services. So, AMIA is building... ...universities, local government units, international organizations like CIAT, FAO, UNDP. climate-related hazards overlaid on the natural suitable areas. And it is very important for investment planning, for infrastructure development, for the development of comprehensive land use plans, uh, DRR, research and development, and disaster management. With the help of SEAT, <laughs> we built on the National Color The dimensions of sensitivity and adaptive capacity, so we know the vulnerability of uh, the different areas in the country. As you can see, this is the whole Philippines. practices in the Philippines and the degree of adoption. So all of these science
Pongay in a designated and vulnerable municipality. The Amiri villages serve as lighthouses or models. What do we do there? Of course, like I said, uh, the program targeted the sites using the vulnerability information that we had. And we had identified 17 municipalities, one for each region, which serve as the rollout effort to test and develop this important model building initiative for the country. Local municipalities supported by the provincial and regional offices play a major to do the actual research. They try the different technologies and compare and then choose the ones which are most uh, adapted to the hazard and to their place. And we also do monitoring and evaluation. We need to identify, this is one of the important lessons that we learn. We need to identify our population targets in terms of social and economic aspects so AMIA villages can also deliver on social inclusiveness goals. So there are different strategies needed for different sectors within a community depending on socioeconomic status, land holding size, and priorities. In doing AMIA modeling, we need to achieve a critical mass of adopters in each village. We need to think of mechanisms to achieve the numbers, and therefore social mobilization is crucial, working on farmer-centered extension, group-based learning, and use of farmers as resource persons. So ladies and gentlemen, when we talk about science, policy, interface, we always remember what it is for the Philippines. Philippine agriculture is mainly smallhold agriculture, and the effects of climate change are worst among agriculture and fishery small producers. 70% of the poor are in rural areas, and they are mostly from agriculture and fishery households. Okay, thank you very much, Alicia. Uh, fantastic, and uh, some great examples of what you guys are doing in, in the Philippines. Uh, I really like the EMEA Village uh, concept. One thing that strikes me, uh, going back to the very first day, I don't know who was here the, the very first day, uh, the, the start of the uh, Agriculture Advantage series. Uh, Simon Wincher was up here uh, giving a presentation and mentioning the importance of multi-stakeholder initiatives. And I think in every single presentation so far, we've, we've, we've heard that come up. So I see there's a theme um, throughout this whole thing, and I would think in the other events we've seen that also. Um, so with that, I'd like to, to transition to our next speaker, uh, Lucy Nganga, who is from uh, the, the Kenya Ministry of Agriculture. Uh, she is the Chief Agricultural Officer there, where she coordinates the Climate Change Unit. Um, she received her PhD in agriculture with a specialization in environment and climate change, and she's spearheading the integration uh, of agriculture into national adaptation plans, NAPS, for Kenya. Uh, Lucy, very welcome. Thank you, Evans. Uh, good morning. It's still morning here. <laughs> um, it's very interesting to come to speak after my colleagues have spoken. One of them from Seat, uh, when he was giving his final slide, I would have wondered whether he had a sneak preview to my beliefs. 
but that just proves that uh, our minds are thinking the same in terms of what is the way forward here of. I want to go to the nitty gritty the importance of agriculture to a country like Kenya, a developing country, the impact of climate change and what it means, what it means to smallholder farmers relying on land fed agriculture. But I'll ask ourselves today, why policy? It is because policy is the one that informs development in most in you know in a broader text. And when you get something planned in a policy, it gets budgeted for. When you budget for something, you do it. You implement it. And of course, after implementation, of course, you evaluate and the cycle continues. So the question today is, whom are we engaging in that vicious cycle? Are we engaging the right people? I've seen quite of a lot being talked of the scientists. Of course, they are very important. And this has been basically the missing link coming from where I come from as a policymaker. So it's therefore important now than ever that policies that are being developed really embrace the scientific knowledge. The scientists get to understand what is it, what are the gaps in the policies, either those that exist or those that are to be developed. Someone said today here that uh, policy making is messy, but I want to correct him. It's not messy, it's only tedious, because it takes time, it's not messy. <laughs> uh, because, and the fact that it takes time, it then means it will even take longer time if we engage scientists because science work also takes time, doesn't it? To have a concrete, you know, findings that then you can integrate to the policy making. But you see, nations or parties are not devoid of policies. The policies are there, they exist. So again, like what we are doing in my country is trying to review them, some as old as when we got our independence, like the Agriculture uh, Act that we have just, uh, you know, redone it. But that does not mean even if it was finished last week, it cannot be reviewed next year, isn't it? Because if there is concrete finding, then when we were discussing here the first day, we are embracing technology and technology is coming up so fast, evolving so fast. So we cannot just sit back and say, you know, that the policy was developed so we can't embrace technology. Review it even if it was launched last week and integrate what is it that will work to help the smallholder farmers. In Kenya, the World Bank is rolling out a 25 million US dollar project. And this project is on Climate Smart, it's dubbed Climate Smart Agriculture Project. And whose main objective, if I may just say, is to increase agricultural productivity, build resilience to climate change risks in the targeted smallholder farmer, farming and pastoral communities in Kenya. And actually in the event of a eligible crisis or emergency, it will provide immediate and effective response. That's huge. But then, to effectively implement this project, it was necessary to conduct climate risk profiling, and this was coordinated, or the partnership was between the World Bank, SEAT, the government of Kenya, and the communities, where the 24 counties, where out of the 47 in the country, where the project will be implemented. And this partnership has really come in handy, because now every county will have its profile, it has its circumstances, its challenges, and therefore the interventions and how the project to roll out its initiatives there will depend on what the profiles really came out with. It's not a holistic thing where you have a national profile, but when you go to ground truthing, you realize really things were not, and you know that's what happens. Some of these things, when you do them at the very national or international level, those who are from GIS, GIS you know, background, you know, sometimes when you go to the ground, things are not really the same at specific points. Um, and therefore, these uh, profiles, I will not really go to the details, but they were to provide the climate, uh, uh, current climate possible, cri current climate and future possible scenarios. Of course, also identify the changes, related vulnerabilities in the you know, populations and given uh, value chains, and of course, identify potential adaptation coping strategies. Now, this partnership pro pro provides a good example of scientist engagement with the policymakers at national level, local level, bringing experts into policy and uh, project development table together to discuss. Now, Kenya has also launched the Climate Smart Agriculture Strategy. It is a policy document. But again, we are now getting to learn as time goes by that this strategy 
did not adequately engage the scientists. And like I'm saying, even if it was launched last year, it's not too late to engage scientists and other researchers and other partners and integrate what uh, needs to be integrated. Therefore, on the lessons learned, like I, my colleague uh, from SEAT said earlier, there are issues of partnership that I'll not go into detail. The timing. I said it's not messy, it takes long, either for research or for policy. The timing, at what time do you do this research to feed into that policy that drives, that, that, you know, that's going to answer into the questions. The platform. The platform to engage institutionally and even at individual scientists themselves. That platform must not be a one-off. It must be a platform that is continuous for feedback, for review, for evaluation, and uh, the scientists themselves must keep it alive and get interested in participating in the policy. That's all the time could allow. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Lucy. Very interesting of what you're doing in Kenya. And... Uh, the, the partnership's important, uh, the timing of how it's done, uh, the platform to engage. Uh, three things you mentioned there at the end I think are, are very key and we see coming up uh, time and time again through this. Um, I'm going to invite up one more uh, person that brings a policy perspective and, and uh, she's going to give even a bit more of a regional policy perspective here uh, to us. This is uh, Margaret uh, Yuvantana from the ASEAN, ASEAN Climate Resilient Network and also a member of the, the Thailand uh, negotiation delegation. Uh, welcome. Thank you very much. Good morning to all. I was advised not to make a presentation, so I would just uh, give my uh, three minute, right? Three minutes uh, talk. So I'm representing the ASEAN Climate Resilience Network, a network that uh, came up from uh, by the ASEAN Technical Working Group on Agricultural Research and Development. So we are under, as you m may be familiar, we are under AMAP, okay? Agricultural Ministers on, agri on, on Agriculture and Forestry. So um, what, what we do, okay? ASEAN CRN is uh, established in 2013, uh, yeah, 2013. And uh, so you see that we are still very young, four years, but the coordinator is getting old. <laughs> anyway, so uh, I think our network will answer the previous question on how the policy get into, how research get into policies, okay? And, uh, and uh, how, how the research work synergize with, with the national uh, programs. Um, okay. Um, First of all, I would like to give you some idea on what is ATW Guard, or the uh, we are on the, the research agricultural research and development body under AMA, under ASEAN, and uh, with this, it is normally a closed meeting, but uh, ATW Guard now opens open up to to, to partners, okay. Uh, so, so international organizations are already uh, invited to, 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 to uh, come here. So we have national studies, as uh, Alice already brought, give some examples. Philippines is one of the Asian countries. So you can hear 10 stories like Alice, what we are doing. And we put it in the Asian CRN. So um, Asian CRN, is, uh, is uh, 10 country activities that is compiled into that. So uh, we partner with the, uh, with the uh, first, uh, how, how policy is being mainstream is that we align with the food and agriculture uh, and forestry vision that, that, uh, that uh, guarantee that uh, our activities is aligned with, with, the, with the 10 countries' uh, policies on, on, on climate resilience. 
Okay, uh, so the network is envisaged to promote uh, climate smart agriculture practices in a wider scale or at regional level. So that is why we conceptualize uh, forming an ASEAN CRN so that uh, the impact would be scaled up. Okay, so um, over time. <laughs> so uh, just now to, to end up my, my, uh, <laughs> my talk is that uh, my takeaway message is that we are partnering with CGR, FAO, and then the, of course we got uh, uh, funded by the uh, government of uh, Germany. What I would just like to convey is that we, um, most of the ASEAN member states are, uh, are uh, members of CGR. And uh, we would like that uh, the activities, the research activities and programs will be aligned to, to, to our national priorities. In that way, we could justify our contribution to CGR. And also, uh, one of the highlights of the ASEAN CRN is our uh, entrance to the, uh, we have this ASEAN common position on issues related to agriculture. And we made an entrance to the uh, COP uh, negotiations. Um, by that, through the negotiations, we need evidence-based. Okay, we need the results of the of uh, results from research so that we could uh, 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 strongly negotiate with our positions. Uh, and because we we are looking forward for the implementations of. Uh, of, of, of these uh, 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 climate resilience practices. Why so short for me? Why others so long? Huh? Oh. Anyway, so so for for there was also a question on the public on the private PPP. Huh? Uh, to tell you that ATW Guard also have a, a PPP framework, wherein uh, we invite all the the private sector as well. To, to work with the government, and that is to identify what really are the needs. It is a net need driven by the member states. And what is strong in, a, in a ASEAN CRN is that it has to be endorsed by the ministers before it could be. So, so once it is endorsed, uh, it could be implemented. Uh, also, um, the ASEAN CRN was able to uh, uh, develop these ASEAN guidelines in the promotion of climate smart agricultural practices and it was endorsed we have already two volumes of that and it was endorsed by the minister so so it it is uh, being uh, uh, used by the by the ten member states ASEAN member states so so that is how how, how we could be uh, ensured that the policy is uh, being addressed on, on the research results. Yeah. So, so maybe I, I can talk more if you like. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Margaret, very much. And uh, I'd invite the, the three speakers to come back up on stage for a short uh, question and answer discussion session right now uh, from the policymaker perspective, both at the national level and then we had a, a perspective from the regional level also uh, in Asia. So um, with that, I'd open up to uh, questions that anybody has. Yes, over here. Uh, microphone, please. That's a <laughs> Hi, I'm John Furl Furlow with um, Columbia University's International Research Institute for Climate and Society. And a question for, I have lots of questions. I'll start with one and you can let me keep going. Yeah, there's one right now. We're a bit um, short on time. Thank you. Alice, I wanted to know how your department or your previous department in the Ministry of Agriculture was connected to the Climate Change Department. I may have the name wrong, but the Philippine, the overarching uh, group that I understand uh, helped coordinate across agencies and how that piece of coordination happened at the highest levels of government. And we could take a couple more questions if we have them right now and then answer together. Are there some more? Yeah, 
um, my question also goes to the MIA project. I, I was really interested with the uh, vulnerability risk map that you have developed there. And I'm interested to know about the criteria which you have used to, 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 to map out the vulnerability. Were they standardized throughout the country or they were varying between regions so that to know uh, what level of vulnerability is it being considered on? Yeah. Any more questions right now? Okay, one more we'll take and then answer these uh, here. Uh, hi, thank you very much for the nice presentations. I, my question, I think, is a, a bit linked to the first one. Um, I, w I, I didn't get from your presentations, I wanted to ask whether these um, initiatives on climate smart agriculture and adaptation and mitigation are really mainstream, mainstreamed in the main agricultural projects and policies. Because I work a lot in West Africa, but uh, we are also involved in Kenya and Tanzania. And sometimes we see that these uh, initiatives are quite disconnected from uh, the main agricultural frameworks. And sometimes it's the main projects that are devel uh, developed by te technical and financial partners that don't really have the climate change or the adaptation or mitigation um, 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 focus, I mean, embedded. So is this like initiatives that are completely disconnected or somehow uh, connected, or is it like a main mainstream uh, or uh, like the main focus of, of the agricultural development in, in the countries and regions? Thank you. OK. I can answer. Uh, OK. Uh, on the first question, uh, we have a climate change commission, which is chaired by the president of the Philippines. And there are three commissioners. And all cabinet secretaries are supposed to be part of the advisory group. Uh, the systems-wide climate change office works under the policy and planning uh, department uh, office of the department. And we serve as the climate change commission in the Department of Agriculture. We do mainstreaming of uh, climate change in policies, programs, and projects. So it is a flagship program about mainstreaming, poli mainstreaming climate change in all our policies, in all the department's programs, in all its projects, in the way we invest, in the way we implement projects, and in the way we monitor and evaluate. So it's not uh, separate, it's uh, mainstreaming work. On the climate risk vulnerability assessment, so we added to that dimension on uh, exposure to hazards, the sensitivity of different crops and uh, the adaptive capacity of local communities using five uh, human capitals. And yes, these were standardized. The project was all about standardization of the methodologies or tools that are going to be used for the agriculture and fishery sector. Because there's a thousand and one methodologies. And therefore, it is important to come up with a standard that you will apply across all the regions, provinces, and municipalities in our country. The exposure to hazards, the National Color Coded Map, has a resolution up to the barangay level. The barangay level is the smallest unit in the Philippines. And therefore, you can look at the different uh, impacts of climate change in terms of hazards, uh, drought, flooding, sea level rise, extreme wind, uh, erosion, etc. Eight, eight kinds as, as, uh, as per prediction in 2050. So what we are doing is to to allow us to allow us to make this uh, long-term adaptation, so we can address climate change, because adaptation happens in the long term. Um, yes. I think Alicia touched on a very important point, which. The first one is just more of a comment. So you made mention that institutions really play a critical role when it comes to adopting policies. And I think this one thing that I find quite missing when it comes to the kind of technologies and practices that sometimes we promote. Mm -hmm. And I think you touching on this is very important for us to see that there is a need for us to always integrate our practices or technologies within the local institutions. Now, Martin also touched on one thing which I think is very important in terms of the role of values. And I would also add the aspect of beliefs when it comes to 
different policies. Now, my question to the three of you is, do you really see that the values or beliefs that exist in local countries in terms of the policy makers always aligns to the kind of policies that is being brought up, especially when it comes to donor-funded projects? Do you see any alignment between this? Okay, I think that's good for a final question for this. Yeah, Why don't yeah, you, yeah. you can each address it and then we can. Yeah, yeah, yes, okay. Um, with, re with our collaborations, uh, with, with international collaborations, okay, I may mention about CGR, which I'm quite familiar to. Uh, we encourage the CGR to develop some kind of uh, adaptation pack package a package or a program wherein best suited to a certain community because you know we have different geographical uh, uh, f uh, nature and so uh, developing a package which is appropriate a specific uh, area would be important and by that we, we encourage the CGR centers or through the CCAPs to work together, not only specifically to a set to specific uh, center, because we, with their uh, different expertise, we would like to use them uh, to see them working together and packaging uh, kind of a adaptation package, something uh, uh, which is uh, uh, so. So we encourage uh, CIAT and CCAPS to to really uh, work together instead of uh, uh, one, one center having one project like that. But they, they should look into, into the real needs or a real uh, adaptation uh, means that could be, that could be uh, effective in, in that uh, certain locality based on their geographical characteristic, based on their vulnerability. So there will be, we expect, uh, we would like to have different uh, packages and so that we could map out, ma map as well, uh, what, uh, that, uh, the, so you can see the variations of, uh, of uh, um, uh, adaptation technologies that is available. So also not only CCAPS, of course, but also uh, DAXA or FAO, of course, uh, we need your and we are very open to exp exp your expertise. So uh, we do it. Uh, we have uh, annual meetings, uh, planning meeting, wherein we invite uh, partners uh, and to identify. Uh, we call it lab uh, lab matching. Okay, uh, the donors, uh, the the organization with their expertise can see what what we really need. Quick comments for you guys to wrap it up. Yeah. Uh, maybe uh, you're right. Actually, the, that, that connection, that linkage has been very weak. Mm -hmm. And I guess that is really why this idea of you know, the organizers failed to, fail to that uh, there need to be a linkage and a strong one mm -hmm. between the partners, development partners, scientists, policy makers, and you know, all the other stakeholders. And I guess one thing we should not also lose, even as we do that at that level, we must also embrace the indigenous knowledge. And that's why for me, communities must be there. Uh, you know, in that you know, gap analysis. Because um, like somebody I actually mentioned this morning is that uh, there are some communities that do their own small research. Mm -hmm. They find what is working, what is not working within the environment. Mm -hmm. By the time the scientist is coming around, they have their own thing going. Now that must not be ignored, can be upscale. Mm -hmm. Research can take it and now even uh, look into things that the farmer may not be able to look to. Into. So you're right, that needs to be enhanced. And remember even when now we go to the funding agencies, like this this year, the issue of looking at what is it the country has put up as a policy forward, you have to align your yeah. funding requirement with that. So the more reason then science must inform that policy because that's where the funding is going so that it's eventually what God has implemented is something that can be that beneficial to the long term and sustainable. Good. Well, thank you. I'd like to thank the panel uh, for, for, for being up here, uh, and we can move on to the next one. Uh, so now we're going to transition to uh, some, some of our uh, development partners uh, to come on up. So 
Um, please, all of you who are in this last part, come on up and, and I'll introduce you as one. Anthony Yes, yes. I've just lost my luggage. I've just been stolen, man. Oh. And I'm trying to work with the police to recover my thoughts. Okay, so I'd like to uh, go quickly through introductions and then, and then each of you will give a three to five minute uh, short, even if you can keep it closer to three, we can have more time for discussion, would be great. Uh, first, uh, actually, first we're going to start, uh, change the order slightly, uh, Anthony Nyong, uh, who is the Director for Climate Change and Green Growth at the African Development Bank. And he's been a pioneer of climate change issues at the African Development Bank in, in initiating its green growth agenda and working to unlock Africa's, African, uh, the African continent's renewable energy potential. Uh, he was also a co named uh, co-recipient of the 2007 Nobel Pre Peace Prize as a contributor to the IPCC. Uh, we have uh, also uh, Dr. Olu uh, Ajayi, uh, and he is a senior program coordinator and lead climate change at the EU ACP Technical Center for Agriculture and Rural Co Cooperation in the ne Netherlands. Uh, he designs and manages portfolios of development projects for Africa, Caribbean, and the uh, Pacific region. And he has a, a broad experience in research, project and grant management, partnership development, multi-stakeholder and private sector engagement, and microfinance. Um, then we have um, uh, Ilaria uh, Fermian from the Environment and Climate Knowledge and Capacity, who is the Environment and Climate Knowledge and Capacity Officer uh, at the International Fund for uh, Agricultural Development. Uh, she has a degree in anthropology and a master's in cooperation and development at IFAD. She is responsible for strengthening knowledge and sharing uh, and learning activities associated with projects uh, with environment and climate co-financing and for fostering partnerships with selected knowledge centers and networks on climate and environment. Uh, we then have um, Mi Nguyen, who is the Deputy Permanent Representative to the Permanent Mission of Canada to the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, the FAO, and she is co-chair of the Global Alliance for Climate Smart Agriculture. And then finally, we have uh, Gerd Fleischer, who is the Head of Section Agricultural Innovation and Sustainability Standards at uh, GIZ here in Bonn. Uh, uh, Jared oversees global programs in the field of agriculture and rural development, including Germany's support to international agricultural research. He has a background in agricultural and environmental economics with over 25 years of professional experience. Uh, with that, uh, Tony, let me pass it over to you first. Uh, Tony's going to have to run out because uh, he has some other things to, to, to get to, but would uh, warmly welcome him here. Thanks so very much for inviting the African Development Bank to this event. Um, but let me extend the title a little bit. For 30 years, it's been science policy interface. And I think there's something like this in there, science policy development interface, science policy implementation interface. We've had several science policies and things on many shelves all mm -hmm. over the place. So the next question is, whose policy actually are we talking about here? Because we've had several people come in and help develop policies, policies, but who actually owns these policies will be those who will support their implementation. So that's where I'm coming from. At the African Development Bank, we asked ourselves several questions of the past two years. Why is Africa blessed with so much renewable energy, conventional energy sources, yet lives in darkness? Why does it have to be the case that Africa, virtually every part of the continent, when you throw a seed up in the air, by the time it lands, it's germinating? Why do we spend $35 billion every year importing food? Why is it that we have regions that don't penetrate each other? So we've come up with a five-fold program we call the high fives. The first is, how do we light up and power Africa in 10 years? How do we feed Africa in 10 years? How do we integrate Africa? How do we 
industrialized Africa. We have the lowest industrialization base anywhere you can imagine. How do we improve the quality of lives of every African? When we look at the Feed Africa program, it fits in together with all this. Because if you do not have the right source of energy, you are not going to be able to implement agriculture. Many of you are familiar with the Great Green Wall that we say we want to put across the Sahel. I've said wonderful, but you create the Great Green Wall, you don't give the people the alternative sources of energy, those trees become firewood for them the following year, and then we go back to where we've been. So we have an integrated program to make sure that we integrate energy, we integrate the concept of integrating people, uh, post-harvest losses, we integrate the concepts of using agriculture to improve the quality of lives of people through good nutrition. So this is integrated. How did we arrive at this? We did extensive consultations with member states. Where are we? Where do we need to get to in the next 10 years? The African Union says we have a, an agenda 2063, and we said, <laughs> I won't be alive 2063. I want to see this happen in this generation. So how do we ramp up these activities here? So because of that, we've uh, come up, for instance, the agriculture. We've, we have several programs we now are implementing. Not that we're just generating this new. No, we have the Climate Smart Agriculture, which we're hoping to put $2 billion in between now and 2020, and leverage another $1 billion from it. We have the technology for Africa agriculture transformation. We need technologies. We can talk from now till forever. Without the appropriate technologies, we can't do it. We have the Enable Youth Program. We keep saying it that at the bottom of the Mediterranean are at least 1,500 young Africans dead inside there. Why? Trying to cross to where they think there's life somewhere. How can we empower our youths? Then we have the AFAWA, the Affirmative Finance Action for Women in agriculture. They make up 75% of the labor force in agriculture, but largely ignored. How do we do this? So in having identified this, the next thing now was, what policies do we need to see these countries develop to drive this agenda? And that's where we've worked on, that we've identified those policies and ensure that those policies are put in. Most times we've always had donor-driven grants and countries dictating what policies they need to do, and those end up in the shelves. Tomorrow it becomes SEAT program, it becomes IFAD program, it becomes AFDB program, but not our programs. So we want this to be the programs of those countries. And finally, to cut the long story short, we've realized countries are bound by the INDCs or the NDCs. And we know that these NDCs were all done for African countries within two to three months, they were all completed, not aligned with policy. So we're setting up the Africa NDC hub that first of all will pick all the indices and align them with national development policies and plans so that countries don't see themselves implementing indices but they see themselves implementing their national programs that will contribute to the NDC targets. Thanks. Good morning. Um, yes, um, from CTA, I just want to talk about one thing about Climate smart agriculture, from what we listen to uh, this morning, is that it is a great approach, can meet food security, can meet mitigation where possible, can also uh, help in adaptation. But the question is, even though there are some cases of successful implementation and adoption on the ground, generally the narrative is that the adoption of CSA and the impact of climate smart agriculture in many cases is still far, far below the potential. Why do we have just adop adoption by so tens, of, tens of thousands? Why can't we have up to millions of, 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 of farmers? That's the question. Second narrative that's, that's common to CSA is that when there is donor funding, an external injection of funds, a lot of activity takes place. You see farmers are interested and keen. But the moment the funding ends, everything goes down south. So we said, why? How can we change this narrative? One of the things we do in CTA is to actually say, we ask ourselves, we need to communicate with people, with the stakeholders. But who are the stakeholders? Some people some mentioned that earlier on, but the key ones I want to talk about, which we uh, support, is the producer association themselves, the farmers' organizations, as well as the, the business and the private sector. 
they need information. It's not just to say CSA is very good for you, but they are asking what is the business case? How does it help my bottom line? That's the question the private sector are, are, are asking. And the moment you can provide that sound information to them and they bought into it. Some of them have some leverage, they can fly with it. We have currently examples of, of projects we are supporting in Southern African region, in Malawi, Tanzan uh, Malawi, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. Where we are bringing together uh, the private sector, what is it, private insurance companies who are supporting, with the, with the farmers organization, who are supporting uh, climate smart agriculture, particularly the weather-based insurance. They are able to put their own money because they see there is something in it for them. So the issue of what information do we provide for and, and, and it's very important. Yes. Second thing also is um, what do you communicate to these policymakers? Many times we talk about the problems, but sometimes you need to highlight some of these successes and say this is what has worked. We had an example of that in one of the countries in Zambia in particular. We just published a small pamphlet to say success stories in African agriculture. And it was amazing, just a small pamphlet, but we got a lot of information, um, demand from policymakers and say, so how did you come about this? How did you go about it? What are the partnerships that help you to accomplish this? How can you replicate this one in our own country? So it's, now it's turning the other way around. So it is them asking us because they have seen that this is something that is good for them. That's the second thing I think we need to talk about. Then the third one is the um, issue of policy champions. To go into these policy making processes, just identify some policy champions who have the heart for it, who are actually already bought into it. Identify them and make maximum use of, of, of these um, policy makers. They could be ministers. But I think I must warn you, we have an example that in one country that after we have engaged with this minister and we, everything was almost done, they even presented a bill to support CSA in the National Assembly. But there was a change in government. So uh, you need to look at who are the policy shapers. These are high-level technocrats that you can enter. I'm glad that Martin mentioned that earlier on. Because the policymakers, these are high-level ones that can, that can help to make some changes, but many times they're not stable because they change. An extreme case that we dealt with is, in one particular country that we're working, we had three ministers of, of agriculture within five years. I know that's an extreme situation. But there's more below them, there are these extremely very, very po good policy shapers that can help the cause and promote this and can influence the, po the people who make uh, policy decisions directly. So we have this convening power and we are, we are supporting them. I, I'm sure I can, I can follow up on that thereafter because this gentleman is telling me I have to stop. Thank you very much. priorities into national and, um, and uh, local policies. And in fact, uh, one of the five uh, main outcomes of IFAD's flagship program, which is called ASAP, Adaptation for Small Old Agriculture Program, is actually a policy-related outcome. And uh, we have, uh, of course, depending on the context, on the countries, we have different approaches to do that. But I would say that there are three key ingredients uh, that we use. The first one uh, is uh, mm, generating and communicating the evidence uh, uh, to inform the policy. The second one uh, is uh, strengthening the local institutions uh, and uh, broker the dialogue among different groups. And the third one is also operationalizing or support governments to operationalize uh, uh, local and national policies. On the um, evidence-based aspect, I think this is uh, the one where the, the role of research is easier to see. And uh, IFA has a wealth of, uh, of experience with CCAFs and also with the individual uh, CJR centers on that. Uh, we have been working together on, uh, I mean, in the past years on topics such as uh, vulnerability and capacity assessments, uh, on the use of downscaled uh, uh, climate models to inform uh, policy actions, uh, on uh, whether the famous uh, tool uh, to co for a cost-benefit analysis for assessing uh, um, the, the economic return, uh, getting an evidence on that. Most recently, we have done also joint work on assessing co-benefits of climate smart agriculture in terms of uh, mitigation, of course, and also nutrition. So um, I would say that maybe one key lesson we, we learned from this uh, process and uh, joint work with research uh, um, institutes 
has to do with the fact that uh, these learning alliances that exist, that are there because we, we actually work in partnership, they can be leveraged uh, to support the policy dialogue processes that sometimes is not done and this is really an important aspect to do. Um, IFAD also generates ev evidence sometimes through simple project implementation and we have a couple of uh, good examples in, in different domains uh, with the ASAP uh, program. Uh, one is in Rwanda and relates to infrastructure. The, the ASAP program in Rwanda is focusing specifically on post-harvest issues and uh, through the project experience now the Rwandan building code uh, includes a specification for a climate proof infrastructure so at policy level and uh, we have a similar example in Mali where the project is supporting the development of a national biogas strategy. Then I mentioned that the second point is on strengthening uh, institutional capacity especially of, uh, of community-based group and uh, if uh, there's always been uh, helping a farmers group, a women's group, indigenous people's group to organize themselves and getting their voice uh, uh, to the policy level. And then uh, the, the third point I mentioned is uh, really trying to assist the local governments uh, in, uh, in operationalizing the policies. And I think uh, this one, uh, um, I mean, it came out a bit earlier on in the, in the discussion, and I think this is a takeaway message because uh, uh, it's a space where the role for research, uh, I think, is not yet fully fulfilled. And uh, I think that research uh, as, uh, as really can, can really assess uh, the effectiveness of policies and especially assess uh, how they bring tangible results uh, to smallholder farmers. So I think if there is one, one new action for future collaboration is this one. <coughs>
investment, uh, uh, if we can make the case. So the three action groups, which are knowledge, investment, and enabling action group, are working together to see what kind of metrics can be developed to track progress on climate smart agriculture, uh, and then attract more investment, especially from climate finance, into agriculture. Uh, so for us, as I know that um, Siat had talked about how climate smart agriculture can, can present a lot of complex challenges, we feel that it's quite at the center of sustainable development and climate change in terms of the potential to bring solutions and multiple benefits. We talk about the triple wins of that approach. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Gerd Fleischer from German International Corporation, GIZ, here in uh, I'm based here in Bonn. Uh, I'm very much enjoying the discussion and the contributions of my speakers. It's very difficult for me to, to put something new on, uh, on the table <laughs> because everybody has been said so, so beautiful and I could not agree more to what they've said. Uh, but uh, let me uh, expand a little bit on, on, a few, on a couple of points that I, want, uh, I would like to highlight. Uh, we are at the interface between science and policy as uh, that's the obvious reason why, why, we are, uh, why I'm in invited to this uh, session, because we are, on the one hand, support science through our support for CJIR and other, other international agricultural resource institutions, so where we look continuously on what comes out of the research pipe in terms of uh, relevance for development impact. Yeah, so that's, that's our main aim. We are putting a lot of money into the CG system and we are in, uh, constantly involved in the discussions about the uh, direction of uh, research. Uh, on the other hand, we are advising our policy makers here in Germany from the uh, Environment Ministry, from the Agriculture Ministry, from the Development Corporation Ministry, and we are advising, advising also institutions in, in, uh, in national governments and others in uh, developing countries. But we are also designing programs, so, and that's why, where we need the science uh, uh, and this, uh, academia and scientists uh, much. Because CSA as such is a complex uh, uh, concept or undertaking. We have these three pillars, uh, like has been said before. We have the uh, food security, nutrition, uh, income uh, dimension from agriculture, which is our traditional a, a, a direction where we come from and where we have clear targets through set through SDG2, through other commitments of G7 and G20. So it's uh, our programs more or less are traditionally designed around these um, uh, um, targets uh, to, to produce the numbers for this. If it comes now to climate change and climate adaptation, there we have the problem evidence is missing. Yeah? So these are, in a way, co-benefits of the food security and, in and, and rural income dimension, where we say, okay, we are also doing something for adaptation, we are also doing something on mitigation. But if we want to sell our approaches uh, to the climate change people and to the growing amount of funding which is available through the climate change windows, then we come into trouble because there are no, it's not enough evidence what we are actually contributing to the 2% goal, to the, to the aim of uh, adapting to vulnerability risks and, and so on. So that's why we need science and that's why we involve more and more uh, CGR centers and other centers like or as well SEAT and, and in our uh, programs and where we, where we need help from, from them. And this I see is the main reason why uh, agriculture is such an orphan or a neglected child in the climate change discussions because it's so complex. And without the input of, uh, of the scientists, we cannot move further. I have uh, my own uh, experiences when I worked in China a couple of years ago where I designed a program for mitigation in, uh, in agriculture with the Ministry of Agriculture from China and where I could only convince the, uh, the, the uh, donor financing to invest in agriculture when, when I said, look at the fertilizer. Oh, there's so much overuse of fertilizer in Chinese agriculture. So numbers say 50% uh, overuse without any imp impact on, negative impact on income. Yeah? But still the discussions were very, very hard to, 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 to guide through with the, with the climate change people because it's not so easy to measure, and uh, it's, it's, uh, this, this, uh, we, we need to work on make this 
this concept of climate change agriculture a little bit more measurable and a little bit more uh, able to sell to the policymakers. So time is over. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Thank you to you all uh, for that. Um, just a, a, a quick summary from my mind of, of, of what I was hearing here. Um, we need evidence to show that we're contributing to the, to the climate goals there. Um, Multi-stakeholder is key. Uh, partnerships being a part of that, also inclusivity uh, and measuring, again, the impact and our effectiveness. Uh, learning alliances is something uh, EFAD and others are, are working on, which has been effective. Uh, finding the champions in, in, in the places where we're working, in the policy uh, world, where uh, uh, even lower than the, the, the top level policymakers who can sustain the changes that are, that are occurring there. Um, and then we need to be connecting and, and, and responding to the programs of countries and it being their programs. Uh, and uh, Tony Nyong mentioning that uh, there's a new Africa NDC hub that's been developed to help support this kind of work. Um, Anthony, I just want to check with you. You mentioned you might need to go early. I want to give you the opportunity if you would like. We've got maybe 10, 15 minutes left. Either way um, is, is fine. I understand if you have another commitment. Uh, so maybe we see if there's a burning question for uh, Tony Nyong, African Development Bank. Uh, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, actually, um, there was a question um, posed to you by, by someone from the um, from the online audience, okay. and uh, the question that was posed was: um, so you suggested that countries were implementing their NDCs because they had to, instead of uh, because they they wanted to improve the resilience or the, the mitigation of of their agriculture. Um, to what extent do you feel that countries are indeed feeling pushed to do this, or uh, and to what extent do do other countries actually, um, yeah, w see the um, see the drive themselves? Yeah, I rephrased the question a bit, but this was what uh, what the question that was posed. And then there's another question over here we can grab right now. Yes, thank you very much for uh, your presentation, and uh, my question is also related to fertilizer, and it's uh, to, to both speakers, the last one and and, and you from African uh, Bank. Uh, uh, in 2006, the, uh, the, at the Af uh, Abuja meeting, the first recommendation was to have, uh, uh, in by 2015, and we are beyond that now, to, to go from an average of 10 kilos of, of uh, fertilizer per hectare to reach at least 50 kilos per hectare, which is quite a, a, a really a necessity, and exactly the opposite, and this must be st uh, uh, said uh, very strongly exactly the opposite of what has to be done in China. In China they have about using 300 kilo per hectare and you are using less than 10 kilos per hectare. So uh, to reach at least 50 kilo which could uh, lead to uh, sustainable agriculture not uh, depleting the soils uh, well you have made this recommendation in 2006 and how what what are the problems to implement it from your po po point of view? Okay, we'll start with those two questions. Okay, thanks so very much. Uh, uh, tough questions, but let me make this Einstein announcement here that climate smart agriculture did not start with us. Our grandparents did it. We didn't call them mitigation, we didn't call them adaptation, but they did it. So our governments can do it. They know what to do. But let's work within their policy framework to determine this. NDCs are important. Our NDCs are important. Africa is a continent. 55 African countries collectively contribute 3% to global emissions. What is the rush in pushing these countries into committing so much because they want to show that they are part of the global system. If every African drops dead and doesn't decompose, we've just saved 3% of global emissions. That's all it, there is here. But then they identified something else, that they have need for resilience. In all their indices, they had two components. They had the adaptation, they had the mitigation. But very few people are talking about that, mitigation, that adaptation aspect because we are focusing so much on driving everybody into two degrees. It's good, 
But the countries are saying, is this our priority? We are diverting scarce resources into addressing climate disasters. And nobody's talking about that. Adaptation is important to us. Resilience building is important to us, but it's not important in the global scheme of things. So how do we help these countries to see that on their own, it is good business. It's good practice for them to do what they are doing. But we've come up with a way of, if you don't do it, you're not part of the global, you're not this, and we have a lot of things. So the countries now are saying, for all the countries that developed INDCs, they were largely 98% of them by external consultants who flew in two, three months, they had developed it and come up. 2009, we agreed on NAMAS, Nationally Appropriate Mitigation Actions. Only about three, four countries have gotten projects to the registry. Why? Because we've not been able to determine what is nationally appropriate, but we did it in three months for INDCs. That's magic. So for the second question, and I believe in magic. <laughs> for the second question, fertilizer. Fertilizer is good, but let's look at it within the scheme of things. Fertilizers are expensive for local farmers. Countries that have had deep penetration have had to subsidize these things to the farmers. But when you look at African agriculture, we are banned from subsidies. And it's a shame because we cannot enforce this. We do not subsidize WTO and all the things you're talking about now is a challenge to us. It is in Africa that we suddenly know the harmful effects of fertilizers, chemical fertilizers. So we cannot finance large-scale project with that. Everyone that climbed up the ladder kicked away the ladder. Let's talk about energy. Several years ago, gas was a good thing. But we can't do gas anymore because it's fossil. Countries having 100% energy access till tomorrow, largely on fossil fuel, but Africans cannot do it because it's fossil. So we, it cuts through all this. That's why I said policies are good. We had that policy, sir in Abuja, but implementation becomes difficult. How do we work towards empowering these countries to be able to implement those policies to take them to where they want to go to? That's what the African Development Bank has decided we will do going forward. Implementation. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So I, think, uh, uh, I think, yeah. We, uh, we'll take another. You want to answer? Yeah, well, uh, Dr. Nyang is... Um, in, in Africa, there's in many places soil depletion. That means uh, f farmers uh, exploit uh, the organic matter in the, and move to, to land which is still uh, available to them. So uh, on, the, on the first side, we would say, okay, put more fertilizer. But if some, sometimes if farmers this do, they, they uh, spread uh, the wrong type of fertilizer, the wrong mix of fertilizer. So they put a lot of nitrogen and forget about the other components of good uh, uh, plant health, nutrients for good plant health. So what we are focusing is on soil health and soils as carbon sinks. So if you uh, uh, put carbon into uh, the soil, you raise the uh, 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 increase the uh, content of organic uh, matter, and then fertilizer will be better used, and also organic matter will, uh, and compost and, and other practices and this will, in itself, the, the combination of, uh, of methods will have, in, in itself, uh, be a good example of uh, climate smart agriculture. And we need, again, we need more evidence from the researchers on uh, what does it contribute in terms of co-benefits to the food security uh, dimension, income dimension, and from the other side also, uh, what are the co-benefits? Yeah? Uh, yeah. Because we need evidence for the discussion. Yes, thank you. Um, Okay. Yes. Of course, it's good to have organic matter. But you have. Right. Thank you. Of course, I, and all agronomists know that you have to combine with different things. But soils in Africa are particularly poor in phosphorus. And this you cannot produce with organic matter. You need to have it. So, I mean, you have really to have to combine it. And the level is so low, and the, the amount that you extract annually by harvesting. The, 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 the food, uh, the, the plants, is much higher. So you are depleting, depleting the soils. And i coming back to, to what you said before. I had discussion, I was in a negotiation team in the past, and I know that Germany always is looking about measuring. And if you measure it, if you want to measure it precisely, 
you will exclude completely agriculture because the, with the annual variation it becomes so difficult and you have a good argument just to subsidize or to fund other technologies for energy but not agriculture. So there are good reasons behind that. And I think, uh, I think this points out the need for the science policy <laughs> dialogue to happen to, fi to figure some of these, these questions out. I open up to other questions, comments that people have here or online. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I didn't introduce myself uh, in the first question uh, when I, I, I asked the first question. I'm Carmen Torres from ECDPM. It's the European Center for Development Policy Management. I wanted to know, I think, uh, uh, touching uh, different issues that you mentioned, whether uh, as in particular this um, um, science, policy and development nexus, but also the food security challenges and other nutrition um, points you mentioned, and also taking into account these trends, this demographic, urbanization, youth trends in Africa. Um, what, what are your views on expanding the focus from agriculture to food systems, and also take into account, for instance, processing, post-harvesting, post and also this increasing food e economy, for instance, these Club du Sahel studies showing West Africa that added value and the food economy is increasingly non-agricultural. And there's a lot of potential within this development uh, and climate nexus to develop also initiatives uh, that could be very useful. So your experience and your views on moving a bit the focus from agriculture to food systems. Thank you take a couple more questions and we're getting close to the end of our time here so are there some others that we can add to this right now okay I'll, I'll add one more to that myself uh, to, to, to wrap up and I think uh, we heard a lot about uh, the importance of multi-sectoral uh, initiatives uh, also going back I was mentioning Simon Winter on the first day mentioning public-private partnerships and I think I heard it come up maybe one time today and just wondering, what do you guys see is, is the role of the private sector? There was another question there from, from before, but especially within the context of the public-private partnerships for facilitating uh, the science policy uh, development uh, and nexus uh, dialogue there. So you can uh, maybe respond to that uh, as you respond to the, the other question. And then we'll just, you can make this your final kind of wrap-up <coughs> statements now, each of you, and then we'll wrap up. Okay, thank you very much. Yes. Um, Transiting from just agriculture uh, to, to, to ag agri systems or food systems. Yes, we believe in that and actually in a recent, in city, in a recent um, strategy, we actually now have what we call the value chain and agribusiness group. That's one of the three pillars of our work. Because we believe that we need to address the issue of climate change, not only at the field level, but across the value chain, we call it from, uh, from farm to fork. So we have that, that's very essential, so at least uh, uh, we can ensure that at each point the climate smartness is embedded into, into it. Um, so they're not mutually exclusive. Second thing about private sector uh, engagement, yes, like I mentioned earlier on, yeah, to you, yes, we need to involve them. In fact, many of them exercise some, some, some political leverage behind the scenes. So I think the best thing is to align them, okay, get them as a body. Okay, in what you want to do. So they can use their leverage to accomplish and not the government to accomplishing um, implementation of policy. Because many times in some countries, the problem is, is not the absence of policies, but it's the operationalization and implementation of policies. So, but this one can help to kind of not the government to, to get that done. But then, but for them to be involved in, they want to see what's the business case for them. Thanks. Okay, now briefly, I think, um, I mean, if had also as uh, pretty much uh, this, uh, this approach now, which is looking at the value chains uh, mainly. So throughout the film production uh, to everything through processing and market and so on. And uh, we, are, we are having, we are trying really to have this integrated approach. There are currently ongoing work streams on uh, climate resilient value chains, which is something we are actually doing in collaboration with CCAFs, nutrition sensitive value chains and gender sensitive value chains. So really trying to to see where all uh, these uh, different aspects can come together. And uh, I totally agree that in, in particular for me there is the, the energy aspects that come out, came out in the discussion which is very important and has to be part of the agricultural discussion because uh, we cannot talk uh, about the transformation of agriculture without looking at energy. 
and uh, we are, uh, I mean, more and more through the ASAP uh, pro uh, program, uh, we are piloting uh, uh, purchase to renewable, uh, renewable, renewable energies, uh, both solar and, uh, and biogas systems, for example. And uh, in especially in these pilots, the role of research is very important uh, because, again, we try to have an integrated approach where, where uh, biogas uh, is also used for fertilizer. So we have, uh, we have currently national research institutes uh, assessing uh, the actual impacts on yields and so on. And, um, and also, yeah, definitely the other aspects to look at are the infrastructure later aspect and the off-farm activities and everything that relates to diversification uh, and uh, yeah, giving more possibilities for, for adapting. Uh, going uh, to the public, to the private sector uh, question, I, I think uh, that uh, what um, what is important. I mean, I think that the, the evidence that is produced by by um, science and uh, research is needed also for the private sector to invest in agriculture, and uh, I think we all agree that there is a need for more investments in agriculture. So this is where I, I see the, the main link. Thank you. Yes, on the, the food systems approach, absolutely. I think that uh, the train has, uh, how do you say, it? has left the train station. <laughs> yes. um, on the global food security policy, it's all everybody's talking about taking a food systems approach. And when we import that into the climate smart agriculture discussion, we always also import that evolution. And at the last annual forum of the alliance, uh, members have all encouraged to take that approach. And as you mentioned in the in, in the area of food loss and waste, there's a lot that, uh, that, can, that, that uh, contributes to the, to the problem, but also to the solution to climate change uh, mitigation and adaptation. So uh, I think that uh, there's no way around it. And it's more how to foster policies that can be as comprehensive, because, and even the research, because everybody has their own bits in each sector and after that in each phase of the food system so how can you uh, try to have a bit more coherence uh, among the various and see as well the cost benefits or trade-offs uh, so far the alliance has pr uh, focused a lot on the practice briefs but we're trying to uh, look at off-farm as well activities uh, in terms of case studies and we welcome the interest of members in, in fostering that on the question of private sector engagement, as well, uh, all members recognize it was really important to engage the private sector. They are a member uh, in terms of the uh, multi, it, they're a, a group of stakeholders that are members. Uh, and now it's the World Council on Sustainable Development who is facilitating our investment action group. And we're trying to see, especially at the regional level, a lot of private sector is, in, is interested in scaling up actions, so we're working with them. Uh, but as well as trying to see how you can de-risk and see with farmers if they want to have some profitability, what are the needs w where you can have cl you know, climate finance uh, being reached or benefiting smallholders, but how in different phase do you need to support through insurance or other types of financing mechanism through public and private partnerships so you can attract more investments from the private sector. So that's part of the discussions in the investment action group. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I also wanted to uh, expand a little bit on the question of private sector involvement. In agriculture, it's, it's, it's clear there must be investment from the public sector and the private sector sometimes it's uh, a bit disconnected, so it has to be rather uh, brought together. So one approach is public-private partnership, but sometimes I'm a little, I'm a little bit confused uh, about the the issues discussed in, <laughs> in, uh, when it comes to uh, uh, private sector participation because we, we should not forget that uh, most of the private sector involvement in agriculture comes through smallholder farms and small and uh, SMEs, small entrepreneurs. So it's not the multinationals what we are sometimes talking about in, in forum who, are, who put up most of the investment. It's, it's others, and they are also private sector, and we have to cater for their interests as well. And if we follow this value chain approach, uh, I think it, there are good opportunities to involve uh, them as well and to have them recognized and have their interests recognized. Great. Thank you very much. Well, a round of applause for the panel uh, right now, and uh, you guys can sit back down. Uh, it's fine. Just a, a quick, a quick wrap-up right now. 
um, as they as they take their seats. We're at the end of our time. Um, just want to say that we we started with um, uh, Martin mentioning uh, that policymakers want solutions. These people they, they they want solutions, just not sort of more problems to deal with. And and that we've heard. Uh, from the policy perspective, they also want to be then operationalizing their policies. So those solutions that help them to operationalize the policies and not just make make more policies there. Um, one of the key part of this in terms of the science policy uh, interface is uh, are these learning processes and, and, and um, bringing the science and the evidence in through those learning processes um, through the multi-stakeholder partnerships as being uh, a, a key part of that. We heard about the Climate Policy Hub uh, in, in Asia um, that's being worked on. We also heard then from the African Development Bank about an African NDC hub and uh, the learnings that can happen there, the connections um, of, uh, of that. Um, to make it work, as I mentioned, partnerships, uh, also the timing of when uh, evidence comes in, uh, the platform to engage um, through uh, these kind of hubs, uh, learning alliances, et cetera, uh, are, are important. Uh, so that we're aiming towards, as uh, uh, Dr. Anthony Young from the African Development Bank mentioned, it's not just about the science policy interface, uh, but it's about the science policy uh, implementation interface. And, and let's really focus on that. We know where we're going uh, and, and aiming to support countries in doing that and, and those that are working on the ground. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank you for being here today. That was a great session. And uh, have a good rest of your cop.